here's something that most people get wrong. What we eat affects our skin because of this concept of the gut-skin connection or the gut-skin axis. This is pretty crazy. The two are not operating independently of each other. So the food we eat will impact our skin health. Welcome to Zoe Science and Nutrition, where world-leading scientists explain how their research can improve your health. Wonderful. Well, I'm very excited to do this one and I have to admit a little nervous. So great to see you. Great to be here. I'm, I'm even more nervous, so <laughs> that makes you feel better. And poor Sarah stuck in the middle of us. I'm loving it. I've got, I, we can gang up on him, Justine. We always I love do. This. Yeah. I can get him back for like the last year of podcasts. <laughs> All right, so I'm not feeling any more relaxed now. Um, I'm going to try and take a little bit more of a back seat today. Uh, and so Sarah is actually going to start with a quick fire round of questions from our listeners. Yeah, so Justine, we start all of our podcasts with quick fire questions. The rules are you can say yes, no, or one line, only if you have to say one line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so there's six questions. First one is, can your skin tell you about the health of your whole body? Yes. Great. Does what I eat matter for my skin? Yes. Wow, that's good news for us at Zoe. Can dairy make acne worse? Yes. And we'll talk more about why and how much. Great. Is it possible to reverse skin aging? We can't reverse it. We can slow it down. Fabulous. Um, are collagen supplements a waste of money? Uh, mm, it remains to be determined. Okay, <laughs> that's allowed. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll, I can simplify. <laughs> Possibly. Okay. Probably. Now, the last question, you're allowed one to two lines. And uh, what I want to know is what's the most unexpected thing you've discovered about skin through working with your patients? I think the impact, the really huge impact that having a skin condition can have on people's psychological and emotional well-being. I think that um, is something that really drives me to um, to want to share with you guys and with your audience why it's so important that we pay particular attention to our skin health. Amazing. So as I was preparing for today's podcast, I was thinking two things. So first, I was thinking I have to be really careful what I say today or I'm going to be in trouble for weeks. <laughs> and the second is I actually thought back to um, uh, Justine and my very first date. And I asked something really stupid, which for those of you who know me won't be very surprised, like, Justine, why did you decide to specialize in skin rather than all those like much more interesting things you could do as a doctor? Um, and Justine explained to me that I was an idiot and that basically skin was the most interesting thing in the world. Uh, and so I thought actually that would be a brilliant place to, to start. Could you tell us like what skin does and why it's so important for us all? And why you went on that second date as well, I think. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I sometimes ask myself the same question now. Um, John, uh, I was going to say Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan was sparkling and witty and all the good things even back then. Yeah, so um, it now just exposed to a bigger audience, which is <laughs> annoying. But um, I thought it was just for me. Um, why do I think skin is the most uh, interesting thing? Um, on a personal note, I had acne myself uh, as a teenager, as Jonathan knows. In fact, still do, still take treatment for it. So for me, it's been a thirty-year journey with a skin condition. So. I think having had that experience and found it really difficult at times, I really want to prevent other people from going through the same. So I think one of the reasons why I think skin is so important is it's visible. Okay. And that can be a good thing. It also means it's accessible. So if we want to study the skin, we can access it easily. We can take swabs, we can take biopsies. But I think going back to basic principles, why is the skin so interesting and important? I think I can distill it into three points, which is hard for me because I'm quite verbose. But the first is that um, there's the skin barrier function, which we'll come and talk about in a, in a moment. But the skin is our outer shield. It's our first point of communication with the environment. And so... Um, our skin does provide sort of some vital functions, for example, regulating heat and water loss, protecting us from UV, from infection, from things we're, we're exposed to around us. The second thing is, um, and you're, you guys will be interested in this, is it's home to our skin microbiome. 
Um, and we definitely will be talking about that, I hope. Um, and the third thing, which I think is one of the reasons why I was really interested in becoming a dermatologist, is our skin tells us a lot about what's going on inside our bodies and gives us clues about the health of our internal organ systems. And so one of the cool things about being a dermatologist is basically we're like super detectives. And so, you know, there are, I think, 3,000 different dermatological conditions. My colleagues might be listening to this and thinking, you know, there are actually 2,000. So if I'm overinflating it, it's because I want to really represent dermatology <laughs> here today. But, you know, 2,000 different ways of looking at red spots. So you have to be really good as a dermatologist at looking at patterns and looking for clues. And our skin does give us a sort of window into um, things that are happening inside. So that's why I think skin is interesting and uh, why I will say it is the most important part of the body. But of course, it's connected to everything. So we can't think of it in isolation. Yeah, I think it's fascinating that it is like a window because I must say it's something that I had never thought of before. And there was a study um, that someone had highlighted to me where they had twins and people were asked to age these twins according to their skin. Okay. And the twins that they aged as being older according to their skin actually went on to die and develop disease a lot sooner than the other twin, just based on them detecting their age based on their skin. That really surprised me. It is really fascinating. I think maybe when we get into um, what are the factors that influence aging, you'll see that there may be some common things between what influences skin aging and what influences aging of our other organ systems. And so um, you can't separate these things out. And I think it's something that you guys have talked about on the podcast quite a lot. And I've certainly heard Tim say is that we can't think of different parts of our body as different compartments separated from each other. It's something I talk about in my clinic quite a lot. All of this is connected. We haven't always understood how science is starting to plug gaps. So we understand now about the microbiome. We understand a lot more about hormones, but all of these bits are connected. And so you can't just think about trying to address one in isolation. You have to, and, and there are, of course, therefore will be factors that influence the health of multiple organ systems. So, yeah. Great. And you talked about the microbiome, which is one of Zoe's uh, real areas of interest. And we talk a lot on our podcasts about the gut microbiome, so all of the trillions of bacteria that live inside our gut and impact our health. But I've recently started hearing about the skin microbiome. I know nothing about it. Jonathan probably does because he's probably heard you talk about it. But I wonder if you could tell listeners a little bit about what the skin microbiome is in the first place, what functions it has, what we do know, and maybe what we still don't know about it. So um, I'll start with the last question, which is we know a lot less about it than we know about the gut microbiome, which might surprise people because I've said that the skin is so much more accessible. So you would think it's the obvious place to start investigations on the microbiome, but um, that, that isn't the case. So um, we know that we have all of these microbes um, living in our gut. We also have millions of microbes living on the surface of our skin. Something that I think is really fascinating is there's an argument always about what is the largest organ in the body, and it's often said <laughs> to be the skin. And so yeah. dermatologists take a lot of pride in that. I've actually recently learned that's not exactly true. Okay. Okay. Uh, for anyone who's interested, by weight, it's the musculoskeletal system. And by surface area, it's actually the lungs and the airways, the sort of gas exchanging surface surfaces are the largest. But what's really cool about the skin is if you were to kind of roll it out flat, it's two square meters. Okay. Okay. That's not that big. Okay. Jonathan's going to say to me for the Americans, I need to give... 10 square feet. <laughs> okay. um, so, I um, don't think she was thinking that way. Yeah. I think we were thinking different metrics. Yeah, I was going to say math, math has never been my really strong point. But there are millions of these appendages, so dips and divots in the surface of the skin because of our hair follicles and our sweat glands and our sebaceous glands, which are oil producing glands. And so actually the real surface area of our skin that our microbes can inhabit is 10 times that, at least 10 times that. So some, some say sort of 25 square meters. So it's huge. So wow. it's, it's pretty big. A football okay. pitch? Um, don't ask me. <laughs> I don't ask I'll me. have someone that's into football. I don't know, but maybe really like a tennis fast. court or okay. something. Like, it's definitely <laughs> getting big. So there are <laughs> yeah, lots, of, there are lots of them. <laughs> And there are good and bad ones. Something that's really interesting is a bit like Tim 
talks about is sort of there being these like mini pharmacies that the microbes he he compares into mini pharmacies in the gut, sending out signals to the rest of our body. The same is true of the microbes on our skin, and so they interact with our immune system. This is really important, particularly in early life. Um, we should talk about the hygiene hypothesis, I think, which is um, the idea that. Um, we often think about small children, babies in particular, being vulnerable to infection, and they are because their immune system is yet to mature and develop. So the theory in the past was that you should keep everything clean around small children so that um, you don't expose them to this risk of infection. And what we've learned is that, unfortunately, by not exposing kids to dirt and animals and um, you know all of this other stuff, we actually we actually reduce the diversity of the microbes that live on their skin and therefore um, this um, affects the development of the immune system and actually increases the risk of people developing allergies and inflammatory skin disorders. And how, and how do you do about letting your own children get really dirty in those first few years of life? I mean, Jonathan knows uh, this is definitely a sort of do as I say, not as I do <laughs> situation. And I, I think it's something actually that I've thought quite a lot about since having our daughter, who's now four, because I was, you know, I've trained in a hospital environment where sterility and um, cleanliness are king. Um, and so that often gets translated into home life. So, you know, my family, you know, will laugh when they hear this, but, you know, my, my, like you could eat off the floor in my home. I often say to my daughter, you can eat off the floor here, but nowhere else. <laughs> um, but we know that this is not great for kids. And actually there have been, you know, a lot of recent, a lot, there have been some recent studies showing that actually exposing children to the natural environment. So there was this scheme called Play and Grow where kids, um, I think there were two to five year olds and they were sent to go and play with leaves and soil outside for a number of weeks. And what's amazing is they found the the researchers found that the kids were less stressed and less angry. They had higher gut serotonin levels than the control group. Um, they um, felt more connected to nature. So by that they like were more prepared to eat vegetables afterwards and were interested in um, in the environment. Um, and they had. Um, greater abundance and variety of microbes uh, on their gut samples at the end of um, at the end of the study. And when you were studying um, dermatology and skin, were you taught anything about the microbiome at, at that point? No, no, I think the first time I heard the word microbiome was as a dermatology trainee. So I was already pretty advanced in in my career. So. But it's relatively new even in nutrition. It's only the last 10 years that we're talking about it. And Justin, something we often talk about is how can we change the microbiome in our gut to make us more healthy, given the link between the gut microbiome and health? Can you change your skin microbiome? So you talked about there's different bugs that are associated with different skin conditions. Can someone change their microbiome on their skin? And most importantly, does that then alleviate some of the symptoms or conditions that you talked about? We're only really starting to get into it, Sarah. And I think often people would think that there's more real science here than there is because I think, um, I'm going to be cynical, but there's a commercial opportunity to sell skincare products that say they're going to balance your microbiome and uh, and supplements. Wow. Okay, so uh, cream that you can put on that will change your microbiome. Yeah. So like a probiotic cream. Yeah, uh, creams containing probiotics. And really? Yeah. Okay. The, so I mean, this is this is not new. It's been you know for the last I don't know five plus years there are these products out there that say they can balance your microbiome. They contain probiotics, etc. But if you actually, you know, I think people might be surprised because if they are into skincare or beauty and have been into a, um, a skincare store, um, looked at the shelves, there are lots of products that have these claims now. But if you look at the science, actually, it's still in its infancy. And um, it's it's not nonsense that there are um, um, some studies where people have been given oral or topical probiotics. And there have been some favorable changes in um, reducing some of these pathogenic, some of these bad uh, microbes that can take over. 
But I think the sort of magic bullety type things that say, you know, probiotic cream is going to balance everything, I'd be a bit sceptical about those things still. Okay, so I've got a question that I think a lot of listeners might be thinking, or maybe I'm just crazy. But we know that yogurt, for example, is a probiotic. And it's going to be a lot cheaper than any of these creams. <laughs> what about slathering yogurt on your face? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> forget I would, the smell. <laughs> I would, this is good. Has goes, anyone done that? Um, I'm sure they have. I'm sure they have done. I'm sure they have done. I don't know of any trial where people have put the yogurt <laughs> on their skin, but I think it goes back to you know dermatologists are used to telling people not to put toothpaste on their spots. Like there are things that are designed for a specific purpose. Yeah, so okay. you know, eat your yogurt um, and. In terms of practical things that you could do um, to potentially support your skin barrier and reduce dysbiosis on the skin, these are things like, for example, using a gentle cleanser on the skin. So I like a cream or a gel cleanser for for, um, washing the face morning and evening. If we overwash our skin, we might disrupt the microbiome on the skin. If we use very harsh... um, soapy um, uh, uh, cleansing products, we might disrupt the microbiome on the skin. So does it strip the microbiome if you use quite a tough, like I like what one that really scrubs off everything that's got all grains in it and will that strip it or does it just reduce it? It can do in theory. And I think we've got to remember that it is quite individual, right? So, you know, some people might say, I use this, you know, exfoliating cleanser and actually that's fine for me. I have no problems with it. If it's fine for for you and it's not disturbing your skin and you have no skin problems, it's probably okay. Um, but the, the microbes on our skin like certain conditions. Mm-hmm. And um, so... If someone has an inflammatory skin condition and is thinking, how can I kind of support the good microbes on my skin? I would say, think about this um, soap-free, gentle, creamy or gel cleanser. If your skin is inflamed, so in my acne clinic, for example, I tell people not to use those scrubs or exfoliating cleansers because if you think of an inflamed surface and then you're going to go and scrub something over the top of it, you're going to increase inflammation in the area. So that wouldn't be a good idea. I'd actually love to take that opportunity to move on to sort of two of the skin topics where we had a huge number of questions, huge number of questions from um, our Zoe listeners, which is acne and skin aging. And I'd actually love to to start with acne. Um, Maybe just start by telling us, like, why does acne matter? So it's a big problem. Okay, Um, acne is the uh, eighth most prevalent disease globally. So not the eighth most prevalent skin disease, the eighth most prevalent disease, you know, full stop. So big big problem. 9.4% of the population have acne. So just think like almost one in in 10 10. people. Yeah, Yeah, it is a lot. And um, it is the most common reason for people to come and see a dermatologist. It's associated with higher rates of depression and suicide. Um, it's associated um, with scarring, which can become permanent uh, in in more people than you think. So maybe um, uh, this is a kind of something that stays with people um, even after the inflammatory phase uh, has gone. And... Um, of teenagers will have acne of some severity. So if they're lucky, that will be very mild. They may just have a few blackheads and a couple of pimples. Um, But for some people, it's very much more severe than that. And they have these deeper red swellings and cysts in the skin, and they're more likely to get the scars. And I I always think it's quite cruel that the time at which people are most likely to develop acne is in puberty because of the rapid change in the hormones. And this is also where, you know, kids are so vulnerable because they are developing their social identity. They're trying to become more independent. They're navigating personal relationships and they've got exams and all of this pressure that they didn't have when they were younger. And then they've got to contend with this very visible and painful um, skin condition. So, I mean... I could keep going, Jonathan, but that those are some of the reasons why I think. Um, is it just is important. it just teenagers? Because I know that's actually not most of the people who see you. No, so for sure it's much more common in the teenage years, and then acne is much more common in males than females in the um, adolescent years and in the early twenties. But beyond sort of early to mid twenties, it is much more common in females, and so. 
a rough sort of rule of thumb is that um, half of females in their 20s will have acne, a third of females in their 30s, and a quarter of females in their 40s. Which is huge, isn't it? So half of all women in their 20s, still a third in their 30s. And what about menopause as well? We hear lots of people talk about getting spots you know, around menopause. I'm at that perimenopausal phase and I've I've never had spots. I've been really fortunate, but I've started to notice I've got a few on my spots. I get uh, on my chest, I get a few here. And you hear anecdotally, a lot of women say Mm. during the perimenopause, suddenly acne returns and spots return. So just to reassure people, if we look at age alone, you are much less likely to develop acne for the first time or to continue having it um, in your 40s or 50s. So the chances of having acne do decrease with yep. time. However, at any time of hormonal shift, you may be more vulnerable to having spots. And um, so we do see it around the time of, of the menopause. We also see it ar- around pregnancy. Yep. Um, and of course, the classic time for having acne is, is during puberty. And is um, it more common than it used to be? Yeah, it is. And I think um, we haven't really always understood why acne has been becoming more common over you know the last few decades. But I think there are two leading thoughts at the moment. And the first is um, the adoption of the Western diet. And the second is increased stress levels. Um, so, And could we talk a little bit about the impact that diet might have on acne? Because I know lots of, of my friends who are parents of children mm. that suffer from acne often will say, oh, Sarah, what should they be eating? And I can't tell them what they should be eating. But I know that lots of people will go on elimination diets. You know, I must avoid all dairy or avoid gluten, etc. And, you know, when I was growing up, uh, acne was blamed on eating sugar, and chocolate. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm pleased you mentioned elimination diets. We should come back to um, that in a moment because it's one of the most worrying things I see in clinic is people coming in and having read that various foods can contribute to acne and have taken that further and started excluding all sorts of things from their diet and are frankly malnourished when they turn up in clinic and also have developed I think, um, disordered eating um, as a result of, I think, um, misinterpreting information about food and acne. And especially for adolescents, that's such an important time to make sure that you're eating, you know, a wide variety of nutrients. You know, the the prevalence of iron deficiency anemia and, you know, in adolescence is huge. And so if people are avoiding certain foods, that's a real problem. Correct. And I think of, you know, my steps. And so we have a 15 year old at home. He'll be absolutely dying that he gets mentioned today, but um, dying of embarrassment that it's not excited, uh, excited. But, you know, you they, they have to sleep so much, right, in their teenage years because yep. they need all this, you know, conserving energy for growing. So actually, we do need to think about fueling ourselves properly um, uh, and not uh, restricting things, particularly when there isn't sufficient evidence to to suggest it would be helpful. So, you know, what what do we know? Um, we know that um, diets with high glycemic content um, are associated with increased um, severity of acne. And so, so can I just tell people yeah, what we mean please by do. that? And, I, and, I, and actually, <laughs> I'm not a nutritionist, so I would rather you explain what it means. Well, we have, <laughs> we have entire podcasts talking about it. Um, But when we talk about high glycemic foods, we mean foods that are typically high in really refined carbohydrates. So white bread, white um, pasta, potatoes, that kind of thing, that cause a really rapid increase in blood sugar. So you eat these kind of foods about 15, 20 minutes later, you've got this big peak in blood sugar. And it also stimulates lots of hormones like insulin. And insulin-like growth factor. And um, so... A little bit about acne so people understand how the sort of pathway um, is connected is that what basically underlies acne is an increase in oil production in the skin, Mm -hmm. blockage of the pores where the oil is supposed to come out onto the surface of the skin by dead skin cells. And then this creates a delicious feast for this particular bacteria, C. acnes, that feeds on this and this triggers inflammation. And Underlying this is a particular group of hormones called androgens. Testosterone is the classic one, which increases the oil production and the pore clogging. And we can connect food to this because these sugary foods and these very refined carbs, um, your blood sugar rises, then your insulin rises, and insulin-like growth factor rises. 
uh, IGF-1, and this increases these androgen hormones. So it kind of, we can connect all the different dots along the, the pathway. Okay, you also talked about inflammation, which is something Jonathan particularly loves talking about, yeah. and I, I quite like talking about it with him. We know as well from our own Zoe Predict research that the food that we eat is associated with our gut microbiome that's also associated with lots of inflammatory factors. We also know if we consume really high glycemic index food, it actually initiates an inflammatory response. Now, this is inside our blood, this is inside our gut. Would any of that be related to the kind of inflammation you're talking about that's going on at the level of the skin? The answer is yes, because there is a connection between our gut health and our skin health. We yep. call this the gut-skin axis. And so, for sure, um, uh, the same sort of principles will uh, apply. That you know, Sugar is the most important one. Dairy is one of them. Um, people often um, will see an association with eating dairy and their skin getting worse, or certainly will have read about it from an acne perspective. And there is some evidence now, mainly uh, there aren't any RCTs as far as I'm aware, it's mainly observational studies showing that in Western populations, dairy can aggravate acne, particularly milk, because this seems to have uh, a greater impact on insulin than other things like cheese, potentially because of the whey content. So whey supplements can be problematic for acne sufferers as well. Um, so the two um, uh, areas of nutrition where there's been most um uh, uh, research and evidence of their impact is, is dairy and, and the sugary stuff. So, Justin, what would your practical advice be to help people with acne? Because there can be a lot of people listening to this who would love to know, okay, what can I do for myself? Or maybe they're thinking, you know, about their teenage children. What would you say? I'd say the first thing is do go and get expert help if it's something that you're not able to manage yourself at home. I'm going to start with that because I think there is a big spectrum of severity with acne. There is very mild acne, which can be self-managed at home with some of the tips I'll give you in a second. But there are people who have much more severe acne. It may be affecting their mental health. It may be causing scarring. And I think in that circumstance, please go get some support from your family physician, your GP or a dermatologist and do these other things on top of that. But um, I wouldn't want to delay people getting um, appropriate treatment. Um, I think there are some skincare tips I would give, thinking about supporting the skin barrier and also, um, you know, in inverted commas, helping to balance the skin microbiome, but, you know, to create a healthy environment for the skin microbes that are beneficial to us. Moisturizing the skin is important. So moisturizing the skin reinforces skin barrier function and it makes the skin uh, a happier, healthier place. If you have acne, people often avoid using moisturizer because they're worried about clogging their pores up more. Look for the words non-comedogenic on a package. That means non-pore blocking. And that is um, something that you might find helpful. Vitamin A, um, retinol, retinoids. This group uh, in topical form is really good for reducing pore clogging in the skin and can also reduce inflammation to a degree, more so for the prescription forms and the over-the-counter forms. But I think what is really important is choose one and incorporate it in your skin routine. So I would say cleanse your skin or tell your teenager if this, if you're going to be relaying the, the information, cleanse your skin with a non-stripping product twice a day, moisturize the skin with a non-comedogenic product twice a day, put a non-comedogenic sunscreen on in the morning and choose one active ingredient or one product with these active ingredients in to incorporate into your routine and introduce it slowly. Because again, you can sometimes do more harm than good if you're too aggressive and overzealous with these active ingredients, try to combine too many of them together, try to use too much too soon. I mean, I remember as a teenager being given a cream for acne and thinking this is the answer to all my problems and like squirting half the tube out and putting it on overnight. And of course, nothing happens immediately and you think my acne is going to be gone tomorrow. And then you wake up the next morning and you're like, you can't smile because your face is red <laughs> and it's going to crack and it's really sore. Mm. And so, you know, I always say to my patients, you know, I'm glad you're excited about using this, but, you know, you do need to, you know, you do need to incorporate it gradually into the routine because you can actually end up doing more harm than good if you are 
you know, not uh, slow and steady. So, Justin, you've talked us through top tips of what you can apply to your skin and your understanding of nutrition and acne. So if I could just summarise back from a practical perspective, based on what you've said about nutrition, uh, you're suggesting that foods that are high glycemic index are going to be a problem. So this is where this perception that, for example, sweets, chocolate might be bad, but also, therefore, perhaps people should be reducing the amount of these refined carbohydrates. So, for example, the white bread, the white rice, the pasta, the potatoes, and any other kind of rapid um, carbohydrates that increase blood sugar. And would you say that that would be a good diet tip that we could also give people? Yes. And I think one of the things you said in this podcast before that I think is like really helpful and practical is even if you do nothing else, you can just switch having your white bread, white rice or white pasta with wholemeal versions of that. You don't have to change your lifestyle yeah. or any of the other things that you do. That's a sort of simple switch that you could make as a starter for 10. Or add protein, healthy proteins or healthy fibres. Um, well, all fibres healthy. You can add uh, healthy proteins, fibre or some healthy fats as well, which will kind of reduce that blood sugar response. Yeah, exactly. And I would also say just life is about balance and it is okay to have treats. And I wouldn't want the take home message for anyone you know, to be that, you know, if they're at a restaurant on their birthday, they can't have the pasta as it's served or they can't have a pudding that night. Like it's okay to do that as long as that's, you know, that is the treat and not the norm, I would say. Okay, so while we're talking about food, I'd quite like to quiz you a little bit about Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jonathan is obviously incredibly well behaved in everything he does. So my perception is, is that Jonathan follows the Zoe recommendations to a T. So I'm not even convinced that he would go and have his uh, birthday cake uh, at a restaurant if it didn't score high on the Zoe score. Have you noticed his diet change since uh, he started the whole Zoe program? And also, I'd be curious to know how yours has changed. So... I'd say Jonathan's diet changed before the Zoe program a little bit, and I'm sure this is why he, you know, went on to um, to form Zoe. Um, Jonathan's talked a bit about, you know, having had um, issues with his gut in the past, etc. I hope you don't mind me saying that, Jonathan. And so had already started making some j some changes to the way he ate before we even met. But I mean. You know, he does live it at home. And um, I think actually after, you know, a couple of years of being told, you know, the... Um what was our life like after I did <laughs> Zoe really and before and before, I say and before you did uh, yeah, Zoe, honey? I say, um, we actually, we have pretty... <laughs> uh, now I want to know what Justin was going to say. The fact that she's thinking twice about how to say it. I was going to say, you know, it's a sort of Let me. minefield here. <laughs> I think... We have a sort of, you know, there are lots of jobs we share in the house. We both work, we both have young children and the sort of split is normally I prepare the food during the week and Jonathan does it on the weekends. That's how we do it. Justine, I have seen on your Instagram account uh, the pictures you've been posting of your meals. They look incredibly healthy. They all look like they will, would score above eight at Zoe, but most importantly, they look really tasty. So this is just sort of part of, thank you, Sarah, this is kind of part of the evolution. So Jonathan was kind of the early adopter and he was, you know, doing Zoe and um, I would be preparing the food during the week. And I think it would be fair to say we were having the same thing on repeat every week because I'm time poor. I've never had very much confidence in my ability to cook. My mum is an amazing cook. And somehow, I think I always felt overwhelmed. It seemed like quite a lot to do and didn't get into it. So after a couple of years of having the same foods on repeat every single week, the same five things on rotation, um, and Jonathan saying, it'd be really nice if we could have, you know, a bit more, a few more plants or what have you. I, um, I then did Zoe myself last year and I was really excited about it. I, you know, I am a science geek and I love the idea of, you know, have, putting on the CGM, seeing what was happening to my blood sugar in real time. I had some shockers, things that I was eating that I thought were really good for me, caused massive blood sugar spikes. Um, I love doing this sort of at-home poop test and all of that, the sort of science experiment at home bit. But having then you know, there's results that arrived that were personalised to me. I was then much more invested in actually making some changes. So it felt less like Jonathan nagging me to do things because, you know, it was good for him or he thought it was healthy for us as a family. Jonathan nag? Never. <laughs> I, I, I don't know who you would be talking about. It sounds so implausible. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of felt like, you know, this was something that um, that I could get on board with as well. And then I think the the 
the biggest surprise for me was actually getting into cooking because this was something I was like a can't cook, won't cook person. And I've worked out for myself that there are a lot of things I can do even without the app now. So I know that if I just have a load of beans, tin, you know, canned beans, red kidney beans, pinto beans, cannellini beans or what have you in the cupboard, I have some chopped tomatoes and I have an onion, um, you know, in the in the fridge somewhere. If I have these staples, I can basically do a bunch of stuff, you know, uh, I can always feed us. And And how much have you changed your diet? Quite a lot, actually. I would say lots. Yeah, quite a lot, actually. I think that... that what, what I love, by the way, is that I said all of this stuff for the previous couple of years, having obviously taken part in the early studies and getting my results, and Justin's like, whatever, just going to ignore you, because obviously I say all sorts of stuff all the time that might not always be right. And um, <laughs> it was only when you actually did Zoe yourself and got your own results and guidance, right, that that made the shift. It was really interesting that then it was like for you, it wasn't just your husband nagging at you. And actually, I wasn't expecting Justin to change very much. I think you had a very clear view that you knew what was good for you and what was healthy. And but it's having actually, that proof, Justine has really it? changed her diet, which is great for me because it means the whole family's diet has um, has shifted dramatically as a result. I think there's something very convincing about seeing your own data. Absolutely. I think that's that's really what it yeah. boils down to. That and for me also the, I, the fact that preparing food doesn't have to be as difficult as as you think it is and and incorporating you know if you have as i say a few of the staples in your cupboard at home you can do this with very little effort and time and i know because i have a four-year-old and i run a clinic and i have a very demanding husband jonathan demanding <laughs> no way and my only frustration is now justin has to take a he's photo changing the, he's changing the topic <laughs> talking no. about how demanding jonathan yeah. is <laughs> so i was gonna say my only frustration now is because justin does most of the cooking now so actually she has much more than she did before because she's she's really got into it out of this which again was not an at all like an expected um byproduct we've slowly sh- learned to eat a lot of things i think like you know we would never eat any sort of bean ever right like that's sort of like you eat baked beans when you're a child. And I think there's no doubt there's been a sort of shift. And what's interesting, I think, I'm fascinated by is um, you eat some of these things the first time. You're like, I don't even, I don't like this very much. I'm eating this because it tells me that it's healthy. And what is really interesting is, you know, if you can stick with that for a month, it's like your whole taste buds change, don't you find? And suddenly you start to think, actually, this is really nice. And it's almost like you're somehow sh- shrugging off a lot of whatever you're you've been learning from this ultra processed food and maybe your microbes are changing a bit with it. And I but think your taste buds on... change. Yeah. So like with salt, salt, for example, which we're over consuming in the UK and it's a big problem how much we're consuming, but you become desensitized to it. And so they say that you've got to gradually wean yourself off it and your taste buds will then start to appreciate it more. Um, I'm really conscious of time and I think it would be great to talk about a topic that I'm really interested in, which is as a 46-year-old woman, I myself and all my friends are interested in skin aging. And so you said in the quick fire questions, we can't reverse signs of aging, but we might be able to slow it down. There may be some people listening to this, scientists who say we can reverse aging, okay. but I think let's talk about some of the practical things that we, we know for sure at this point can, can so slow things perhaps, down. Perhaps we could start by talking about what actually causes skin aging so we know what potentially we can avoid and then some great tips from you on how we can actually slow it down as well. Okay, sure. So I think when we think about skin aging, we divide it into sort of two um, categories. There's intrinsic aging. So this is is the passing of time, so chronological aging and genetics. And I think a lot of people would expect that those have the greatest influence on how our skin ages. So you mean, for example, if your mum, your mum's or or father's skin aged well, you might think, well, that's fine. I'm going to have great skin as well. So yes, correct. And also that you might expect that someone who is 70 looks older than someone who is 60. Okay, so there's also this sort of chronological age. Then we have the second category, which are um, extrinsic influences on aging. Meaning? The, so meaning things that impact our skin from um, the environment, so environmental exposures. And actually, um, the the most influential of these is sun exposure, and we call that photo aging. 
And people will probably be amazed to hear that 80% of visible skin aging is attributable to sun exposure. 80%. 80%. So if I had, which I didn't, unfortunately, stayed out of the sun, put sun cream on religiously up until now, and I've only just started wearing sun cream since I've been watching you <laughs> on Instagram talk about how important it was. If I'd have slathered myself in sun cream up until now, could my skin look... Could you look even more youthful than you do already? Could I look like my 20-year-old self? <laughs> I mean, possibly. So the, you know, the evidence is that sun-protective behaviours, and part of that is sunscreen. Part of it is also you know, staying out of the sun between 12 and 2 when, you know, the sun is directly overhead, wearing a hat, um, you know, covering up in the sun. So it's not, you know, sunscreen is part of um, the armamentarium, but it's not everything. But yes, the answer is that protecting your skin in the sun can for sure slow signs of aging. And I think this is quite empowering because we can all do this. It's, yeah, it's, it's in our not, control. Exactly. It's not very difficult. I remember Justin and I went on this amazing holiday to Japan uh, early in our relationship when I was trying to convince her to like stay with me. And um, we saw all these um, women there, right, of all ages, basically with umbrellas. Um, and it's not raining. It's like a sunny day. Yeah. And so you see like this huge focus there on managing skin exposure. And Justine was like, this is part of why they all look so incredibly young. Isn't that what Yeah. And actually me? that reminds me of something, that, you know, that's also very interesting is that um, – how we age. Um, so, you know, the the manifestations of aging may be slightly different actually in different populations as well. So in um, uh, more sort of European populations, wrinkling may be the predominant thing. And um, in Asia, so you were talking about Japan, um, uh, brown marks or brown spots, dark spots, whatever you want to call them, these pigment changes may be the predominant hallmark of aging. But, you know, some, sometimes people wonder what we mean when we say skin aging. What are we talking about? And we're basically talking about the skin becoming drier over time. We lose more moisture through our skin. We um, we lose collagen, this sort of protein in our skin that makes it firm and, um, and uh, reduction in collagen causes the skin to wrinkle more and to sag more. Um, and then the other thing that we get is these dark or brown spots on the skin. Um, and so lots of people I know are taking collagen supplements on the belief that they will uh, enable their skin to stay younger, look more youthful. Do they work? The the jury really is still out, Sarah. I mean, am I recommending these in my clinic? No, is the answer. Are there other doctors recommending them? Yes. Um, people might want to know what we're talking about when we say collagen supplements. These are, This is sort of collagen that people take in, I guess, capsule form. Um, they're broken down into peptides, absorbed in the intestine. Um, it has been proven that they do find their way into the bloodstream about an hour after they've been eaten, and then they accumulate in the skin. And the idea is that they um, trigger increased collagen production in, in the skin, which makes the skin firmer, that they may trigger elastin in the skin, which is this other um, protein that makes the skin more springy, mm -hmm. um, and also improve hydration uh, in the skin. And there have been some studies that show favorable effects when people have taken collagen supplements. There's others that show um, less of a benefit. The difficulty with interpreting the data is that a lot of the studies are sponsored by um, companies who make supplements. So they have an interest in presenting the data in a way that would show you know, that there's a favorable effect. And a question I always have is, um, we know that we tend to absorb these nutrients better when we get them in food. Yeah. So do we really need to take a collagen supplement? Couldn't we be thinking more about, you know, the Mediterranean diet and um, and getting these, um, getting these uh, nutrients in our food? So before going and shelling out a lot of money on collagen supplements, because that's the other thing, the studies have shown that the effects don't last when you stop taking the collagen supplements. So um, this is something that if you were deciding that you were going to take on board, you'd have to keep on doing that. It could end up being awfully expensive. So why don't we think about the, the inexpensive, easily accessible things that we can do that have lots more evidence behind them? And that's the sunscreen retinol. Um, so ret retinol comes from vitamin A. 
and um, it's av- it's available in topical form for um, improving signs of skin aging. Something you put on your skin in the evenings usually because it can make the skin a bit more sensitive to to the sun, and um, that can boost collagen production in the skin, making the skin um, firmer and can also help with um, reducing the appearance of some of these um, brown marks that appear on the skin as well. So that would be something that's real, is it? Because I remember when I first met you, I'm like, this is all potions, isn't it? Isn't everything that you put on your skin is all fake? That's real. I often say there are three things if you want to think about skin aging that you can incorporate into your daily routine. And sunscreen is number one. Number two is using retinol at night. And for anyone who's listening to this who may be pregnant or trying to get pregnant, that's not the time to use retinol. It shouldn't be used at at that point in life. Um, And the third thing is thinking about um, antioxidants that you can apply to the skin. And vitamin C is the most studied one. Um, So we know that if you apply vitamin C to your skin in topical form, that this increases collagen synthesis. It helps to boost your own um, collagen production. It helps to reduce um, dark marks on the skin. So we make uh, make fewer of these. Um, And um, it also um, uh, protects us from inflammation in the skin um, as well. So so vitamin C, topical vitamin C is important. Um, And there are other antioxidants, so things like resveratrol, um, coenzyme Q10. So I know there are other antioxidants that are important, but but basically these three groups, antioxidants, sunscreen and retinol are the, the key things. And I wonder if I could ask you two top nutrition skin myths that I have seen doing the rounds on social media. They might not be myths, so you're the person uh, to ask. One is that polyphenols are our own natural sunscreen. Is that correct? Because I've seen this as headlines. Just eat loads of polyphenols. You don't need to apply sunscreen. (laughs) I would say, why don't you do both? Okay, okay. <laughs> so I think we're not yet at a posi- in a position where we can say that there is something that you eat that is going to protect your skin um, well enough so that you don't need to rely on sensible sun protection behaviours, staying in the shade, wearing a hat, covering up with clothing. If you are someone who doesn't like using sunscreen, there are other things that you can do. I personally am very comfortable putting sunscreen on exposed sites and um, um, and I wouldn't rely on on these um, uh, oral polyphenols. But it's not total it's not total nonsense in that okay. there is um, there is there is theory there. So, for example, if you think about a, a carotenoid like lycopene um, may have some photoprotective effects. Omega three might have some photoprotective effects. But I definitely am not swapping my sunscreen for those. Okay, great. The other thing that I've seen in lots of headlines is intravenous antioxidant vitamin drips. It will make you look 10 years and feel, but make you look 10 years younger. And this is a growing craze, I think, amongst a a, a niche community. And for those of you listening, Justine is shaking her head ever more vehemently as Sarah is saying (laughs) this. I'm just not even going to talk about. Yeah, no, I, I don't believe in those. Okay, so I often use the word nutribolics to talk about nonsense when it comes mm-hmm. to nutrition. And what you're saying is intravenous antioxidant drips to make your skin 10 years younger is nutribolics, but polyphenols in as a potential sunscreen isn't advisable, but there is some science behind why it might be photoprotective. I think, yeah, I may, I may have even sounded much more strong on the polyphenols <laughs> of sun protection than I intended to. What I'm saying is I wouldn't dismiss it, like, you know, keep an eye on the space, but for sure we're not at a position yet where I would say swap your sunscreen for that. And the antioxidant drips, I'm always, pre- like, in, you know, when you work in science or in medicine, you have to keep an open mind because things change. I'm prepared to be convinced that the, those are a good idea but i'm not at the moment and i have to ask a follow-up question because it like impacts my life how important is it in fact that you apply uh sun protection it is important okay I and mean, i think we've talked about skin aging here and um but you know there are other things right like your risk of skin cancer increases with age um and with cumulative uv exposure uh, with sunburns that increases your risk of skin cancer too not to you know you know, not least because also they're uncomfortable at the time. So protecting your skin in the sun is more than preventing your skin looking older earlier. It's also about reducing risk of things like skin cancer. So just before we run out of time, I mean, we've talked a lot about food. We've talked a lot about um, sort of skincare routines. Is there anything else that a listener can do that can really affect the health of their skin? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, stress is is 
mega and um, and sleep. And so actually in the clinic, when I counsel people about how we're going to manage their skin condition, I always start with genes and hormones. And then we talk about skincare habits. We talk about um, the food we eat. We talk about stress and sleep. These are the, sort of the key things we touch on. But something that I think people might be really interested to know is I, I mentioned earlier about people with acne having higher rates of depression and suicide. Um, did you know that um, some of our stress hormones, so thinking about this brain and skin connection, some of our stress hormones actually get released in the sebum, the oil, from our oil producing glands in the skin and literally bathe the surface of our skin. So the in connection... Stress. We are like bathed physically in stress correct, when we're stressed. Correct. So so it is there is definitely a really strong connection between, um, between the brain and the skin uh, in ways that people might not expect. Yeah, it's really interesting because I've always thought of the skin as just this inert outer layer, like we started, you know, when we started talking. But talking to you now and obviously, you know, having listened to lots of your Instagram posts, it's, it's fascinating how it is a living part of us. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's got, you know, we've got this, this community of all these bugs living on us as well. So um, uh, it is very much a sort of... Uh, reactive dynamic uh, organ and there's so much more we're still going to learn about it but you know I hope I've convinced you oh that absolutely looking, you know people often think about you know going back to Jonathan's original point about how when he met me he wondered why I wasn't you know a kidney physician or something like this and um, you know skin is absolutely it is absolutely fascinating and there's as I say so much more we're learning about it um, so I hope I've convinced everyone else of the same I wouldn't be allowed home if I didn't say yes, so not... I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to answer any other way. Amazing. Thank you very much, Justine. I'm going to try and do a little summary, and I'm going to... I really have to get this one right. Yeah, so Jonathan, before you do Ooh, your Sarah, summary... Sarah, you're going to do the summary. I'm not going to oh. do the summary, but before you do your summary... Um, I have been subjected to a year of quickfire questions from you. Uh -huh. Justine has been subjected to about six years of quickfire questions. Uh -huh. So we have some quickfire questions for you. We have five questions. Oh, no, I wasn't prepped for this at all. That's very unfair. Okay, go on, Sarah. Five questions each. Okay. Okay, the fifth question is going to be tough. Are each of our fifth questions tough so you get two points? All right. So you can get a maximum of 12 points. All right. Well, okay. I'm very competitive, so I'm heading for the 12. Now. If you don't get 10 out of 12, there is going to be a forfeit. Oh, dear. So the forfeit <laughs> is if you don't get 10 out of 12, you will either have to drink a Diet Coke. Right. Or you'll have to eat a McDonald's. And we're going to let your son, Zach, decide which of those you're going to have to do. Oh, well, I, I can't do either of those, so I better score 10. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure is on. So I'm going to go first. Right. Now, my questions are going to test just how much you listen to me. Okay. Um, and how much you've listened to the podcast. Okay. Okay. Well. Ready? Yes. Okay. Are, this is a controversial one I'm going to start with. Are all ultra-processed foods bad for you? No, if you use the Nova classification. Well done. Should we all be taking omega-3 supplements? No, because you can also get it through diet. Okay, great. Does diet improve menopause symptoms? Yes. Okay. Who do you prefer doing podcasts with, Tim or me? <laughs> That's like choosing between your parents. I love them both equally. Oh, Jonathan, damn it. I think okay. I should, I should take a point all away right, for that. Right. Tim's not here. I prefer you, Sarah. Oh, I want to get, so just in case I get nine points, I really don't want to have to eat the McDonald's. <laughs> um, yeah, I would have deducted a point for that. Okay, now this is the challenge. This is the two point question. Okay. All right. Okay. Now it's quite tough, but all I've right. talked about this so often on our podcast. Okay. Okay. So what percentage of energy is not absorbed when you eat nuts? Ooh, so that's this is really so this hard. is for people listening, this means by what percentage back of pack labeling overestimating the energy content. Is it I'll let like you a go. Third? I think it's about a third. Oh my goodness. Well done. Oh, that's six okay. out of six. Oh, you see, I always I always listen to you. So. Fresh, fresh. Now we're over to Justine. All right, I'm more scared about this one, I have to admit. <laughs> so, no, you don't have to be scared. And actually, I'm testing your truthfulness here because I know the answer to some of these questions. Okay. So right. um, it'll be okay, interesting that by sounds the like that's really you hard. You have, have to help me keep counting here, Sarah. So number one is going to be, um, is acne more common in males or females? 
Uh, I know at least for adults, it's more common with women. Okay, yeah, that's correct. But you said for adolescents, it's more common in men earlier. So exactly. So so over the age of twenty five, more common in females, and in adolescents in males. Well done. What I can't is... tell you by the way how nervous I am right now. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. Look, we've oh. had I've had years of your quick fire questions. I realise no it's a lot easier to ask them than to have to answer them. I have more sympathy now with all my guests. <laughs> okay, so question two is: What is the minimum SPF I would consider um, uh, buying for a sunscreen product that we keep at home? Five hundred. No, that was a joke. Fifty. So I would say thirty or higher. Okay. Justine says that. Shall but we let she, him but, have that point? No, because the reality is she says that, but we never buy one that doesn't say 50 on it. So I okay, feel like hold that's on, it's the... yes or no. You're now uh, explaining your answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think we can accept 50. Okay, I think we can we'll accept 50. That. Um, the answer is 30, though. Um, and the next question is, which meal or food do you most associate with happy times? And I know the answer. Oh, uh, gelato, ice cream. I thought that was what he was going to say. So um, for context, um, for people who, uh, you know, who don't know, um, Jonathan um, family have been going to a particular place in Italy uh, in the summers for... I'll say I was going to say centuries, but then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh, he's been quite, he's been good. He's been excellent skincare. Your skincare, <laughs> yeah. And I know that Jonathan, one of Jonathan's big passions in life is gelato, and this is something that Tim might say it's a heritable trait. Uh, this is something that uh, that my stepson has definitely uh, inherited. Um, my next question was, what is the Zoe inspired meal that I've made that you've most enjoyed? Ooh. This is question four. Yeah. That's, um, I think that um, the one I have most enjoyed is when we actually had um, uh, Will Bolswich, who many people on the podcast know, and Sharon, who's our head of marketing, round uh, for dinner. And they're both vegan. And you made this sort of um, bean stew, which was absolutely fantastic. And if you had said to me 10 years ago that I would have eaten like a vegan bean stew and said that it was amazing, I'd have been like, what? But like, where's the steak? So that would be my favorite. I and think. the only person who didn't enjoy that meal was my stepson. who was like, <laughs> said, where's Where the steak? Where's the, the meat? meat? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so I've got one more question. You've got one more question. This can be the one that is the bonus question, but he's doing fine. So... He's not going to get a forfeit, unfortunately. Oh. Damn it. Okay, I was going to say Star Wars or Princess Bride. Oh, well, that is so tricky. Oh, well, I'm going to really divide the audience, you see. I feel like that's really like being asked to choose your favourite child. So this was um, one that we, when Sarah said we're going to do some quickfire questions, and by the way, you can see I'm obviously not used to the quickfire questions because they've taken a bit longer to answer. <laughs> However, we had to have a consultation at the dinner table last night. So Jonathan Jonathan uh, was out last night. So the family sat around the table and this was the question that we chose together. I think I'm ultimately going to go Star Wars, but I mean, I, f I could... It's, okay, I'm going to go Star Wars. Okay. So. Will Zach still talk to me? I mean, I don't know. I think you will. <laughs> well done, Jonathan. You've scored 12 out of 12. You do not have to eat McDonald's and you do not have to have a diet cake. Wonderful, which will keep my skin looking um, healthy for longer. Let me do a quick summary um, of, uh, of today's session where we covered a lot of stuff. I think the first thing we said is like, Skin is really important. You know, it's not just this imper impermeable barrier. We now know it has its own microbiome of these millions of bacteria and that interestingly, lots of skin conditions that we have are actually linked to sort of individual sort of bad bugs in that context. Uh, we talked about acne, which is one of the big topics that our members wanted to talk about. Apparently half of women in their 20s and still a third of women in their 30s um, have acne. So it's not just something that you go through as, as a teenager, that it can have really life-changing impact. You talk about people even you know, committing suicide, which is really terrible. Um, interestingly, there is some evidence that food can be... Um, uh, uh, can have an influence and specifically dairy and sort of food causing these big high blood sugar spikes can be an issue. But there is also a danger of people going to this, like cutting all their diet out and that's even worse. So to sort of be cautious as one approaches that, that we had some great sort of um, practical tips. So gentle cleanser, don't strip your skin, 
moisturizer you can do if you have acne and none of these devices that are sort of scraping at your face and Justine described you know using her fingertips um, which I can tell you is, is indeed how she does this then we talked about anti-aging um, so uh, Sarah wants to know how to continue to look 30 forever which I think is uh, uh, definitely this is achievable. why I keep coming on the podcast because you keep saying nice things <laughs> and what Sarah said is that I'm sorry what Justine said is actually sun exposure is 80% of your skin aging. So really it isn't about your genes. It's about things that are under your control. So so that means sunscreen and just not being in the sun, you know, like all the time is, is really important. But there are some real things that you can do. And you mentioned retinol and an antioxidant like vitamin C, both of which I refuse to do because it's too much effort, but I know that Justine does religiously. Um, and then finally, we talked about sort of what else can you do? So firstly, been those collagen supplements, been all these other supplements. Like in terms of the amount of money, this is isn't worth it. Worth it, and a lot of it, I think, there's very little evidence. On the other hand, interestingly, stress can have this huge impact. So if there's things you can do that reduce stress, it really can affect um, your skin. And amazingly, apparently, if you are really stressed, you're actually bathing your skin in it, which I'd never heard before. It's slightly terrifying because I get stressed quite often, and this idea that you're sort of soaked in it marinating, uh, in marinating it. it is is amazing um but also sleep and even just going into nature might um be able to do something for all of you who are listening to this working from home therefore is so sort of like keep listening to the podcast but walk out into nature and improve your skin sarah and justine thank you so much thank, thank you. you that was fun enjoyed it me too thanks for having me oh it was a real pleasure and it I've got through it without anything too disastrous, so I'm pretty happy. Sarah, you obviously didn't know the right questions to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Thank you, Justine and Sarah, for joining me on Zoe Science and Nutrition today. If you want to understand how to support your body with the best foods for your skin and your gut health, then you may want to try Zoe's personalized nutrition program. You can learn more and get 10% off by going to joinzoe.com slash podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jonathan Wolfe. Zoe Science and Nutrition is produced by Yella Hewins-Martin, Richard Willen and Alex Jones. See you next time.